Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Wednesday, October 18th, 2023. Good as always to have you on board. We just finished the November issue of Proceedings, our annual Marine Corps focus. Uh, and it's always a great issue, but this one is particularly meaty. For, so for our uh, Marine Corps uh, readers and members, uh, this will be one you will not want to mi- uh, not want to miss. Um, today's show is brought to you by Blue Cross Blue Shield. What makes good vision coverage? I knew it when I saw it. Things like fully covered vision care exams for all members, access to over 125,000 independent eye care providers and national retailers, plus benefits you can use at many online retailers. That's why I chose Blue Cross Blue Shield FEP Vision. See what we can do for you at bcbsfepvision.com. Okay, before I get to my guest, I'd like to highlight two things happening here at the Naval Institute. First, in honor of our 150th anniversary, we have a special membership discount this month. Join or renew and get $15 off. If you're not a member, or you'd like to give the gift of membership to a shipmate, a friend, or a family member, go to usni.org forward slash join. And next Wednesday, 25 October, is the annual Naval Institute Naval Academy co-sponsored applied history event. This year it's titled Critical Thinking, Our Greatest Weapon to Winning Tomorrow's War. Uh, Speakers and panelists will include former Secretary of Defense James Mattis, former Deputy Secretary of Defense Bob Work, the former CEO and chairman of Google, Eric Schmidt, authors Peter Singer and Trent Hone and others. You can attend in person or virtually to register. Go to usni.org forward slash events. All right, let's get to our guest. So my guest today joining me from Annapolis is Captain B.J. Armstrong, U.S. Navy. He is a uh, associate professor of war studies and naval history at the U.S. Naval Academy. He's the author or editor of seven books, And this month, he's the author of a proceedings article in the October issue titled Counterinsurgency to the Shores of Tripoli. BJ, welcome to the show. Bill, thank you so much for having me aboard. It's great to be back with the podcast. Well, thanks for having, uh, you know, uh, thanks for weighing in on this maritime counterinsurgency project. So for our readers, uh, starting in July of 2022, we kicked off... um, what was Hunter Steyer's vision of a project uh, to tackle what's happening in the South China Sea, how China is uh, acting very aggressively, illegally, uh, particularly in that uh, gray zone or insurgency uh, level be- be below the level of open warfare against its uh, neighbors and against the international maritime norms and, and uh, legal uh, regime set up under UNCLOS and other, other things. And uh, this article is one of those maritime counterinsurgency ongoing project uh, articles, and it provides lessons from the Barbary Wars for today's efforts against China in the gray zone. So, BJ, at the start of the article, you write this, I'll quote, countering maritime insurgencies in the gray zone is not a new mission. Indeed, it was the U.S. Navy's founding mission. So let's start there. Just give a, a, a brief overview of the Barbary Wars, if you would. It's a it's a good starting point. And I think I want to point out, you know, despite my phrasing there, right, I'm using phrasing that it leverages our contemporary vocabulary, our contemporary jargon from the military. But we have to remember that navies across time and the U.S. Navy in particular in the early American period, they saw this as a fundamental part of their job. Right. Uh, we can apply the label maritime counterinsurgency. We can apply the label gray zone. They're very uh present day labels. They're kind of anachronistic in terms of how the folks in the past would have thought about these missions because they didn't think of them as something special. You know, I write that these are things that come from the very founding era of the U.S. Navy, both because of the Barbary War and because the conflict that came before that, the quasi-war with France. Both of these conflicts are they're about the United States Navy learning how to operate in a great power world how to maneuver in a multipolar world. Again, labels, things that we think are prescient and current today, but are really things that navies have done for centuries. So the Barbary War itself is the result of actually centuries of conflict. Uh, Corsairing as a a method of conflict 
between the Islamic North African sultanates and, and what became the Ottoman Empire, as well as the Europeans, particularly Southern Europeans, but also uh, Catholic church forces, this corsairing battle, privateering as we might call it in American context, actually dates all the way back to the Crusades. And so this tension in Mediterranean waters is a longstanding thing that the United States is basically born into. When the United States gains its independence from Britain, they lose the protection of the Royal Navy, which for decades or centuries has been protecting American merchant traffic in the Mediterranean because they were considered British. And so all of a sudden the Americans have to defend themselves. They do this in a number of different ways. At first, largely they follow the model of European powers and they, they pay what is in essence protection money. They pay tribute to these sultanates. And they sign treaties with Algiers and Tunis and Tripoli and Morocco, promising to pay those leaders uh, a certain amount of either, either gold or silver, or in some cases goods each year as a tribute. And, and then those leaders would keep their maritime forces away from American merchant shipping. What ended up happening is the Sultan of, or the, the day of Tripoli, Karamanli, discovers that he's not getting as much money as the others are. And mm -hmm. he doesn't like that. And he demands more and the Americans refuse. And so he declares war on the United States uh, in kind of dramatic fashion as they, they did in the tradition of North Africa. He sent his troops into the courtyard at the American uh, consul's house at the, the embassy, if you will, and chopped down the flagpole that had the American flag on it. Uh, and that was a declaration of war. Interestingly, the United States never declares war in return. Instead, Congress authorizes the United States Navy to use force. It authorizes the appropriation of, of money to spend on operations in the Mediterranean, but it never declares war. This is a similar pathway that the quasi-war with France followed, also an undeclared war. We think about war powers in our modern context. We think of Congress's responsibility to declare war. The first two conflicts that the United States and the United States Navy fight are undeclared. Um, but Congress has given the Navy the authorization to conduct combat operations in defense of American interests in the Mediterranean. And so a series of squadrons are sent to the Mediterranean with a mixed amount of success amongst the leadership and amongst the squadrons. But their job is, in essence, to fight a, a regional conflict that's not a traditional naval conflict in the sense of Mahanian sense that we think about it today. It's not ships against ships. It's not, you know, ships of the line lining up and having a battle that's decisive that ends a conflict. Instead, the kinds of operations that they're conducting, the Americans are, are what today we would term maritime security operations. Um, they are convoying American and, and friendly merchant ships. They're conducting blockades. They're trying to hunt down corsairs or privateers from Tripoli. And eventually they get involved in a land campaign using mercenaries and local forces, as well as a handful of Marines uh, on the quote unquote shores of Tripoli. Um, and so it's, it's a really interesting kind of complicated conflict. And one that is so far in our past, you know, more than 200 years ago, that we often see it in a caricatured kind of way. No, that's a great summary. Uh, I know I saw it as a as a caricature, caricature, and I know that as a plebe taking the uh, mandatory naval history class my first semester, and I always had it right after lunch, and so I, I, I'm embarrassed to say I slept through a lot more of it than I should have. And so this article, you know, just brought some things to life for me when I read it. And here I am, a you know, seven year retired Navy captain. And, I'm, and to, to me, a lot of it was sort of new history. Uh, one of the things that that really uh, stood out for me was that you look at uh, this, the, you know, the Navy's success in this series of wars or, or you know, the ongoing conflict through a couple different lenses, starting with the ships themselves. And so, you know. Uh, folks, beginner naval historians like myself, familiar with the names of the frigates that fought against the Corsairs, you know, the Constitution, Philadelphia, Chesapeake, but a lot less familiar with the smaller schooners and the brigs and the roles that they played. So can you describe the, the different types of ships that were in the Mediterranean squadron 
and, and kind of how they were brought to bear effectively? Much of our knowledge of the what we might today call force structure or fleet architecture of the early American Navy is really driven by the title of one book, right? Like, and it's a great book, but Ian Fole's Six Frigates right. uh, is a fantastic history. It's a great book, but that really kind of dominates our understanding of force architecture and, and the fleet of the early Navy. We think of the frigates, we think in particularly of Humphrey's super frigates. I mean, these are frigates that are, you know, honestly, they're quite a bit larger than most other frigates in the world. Most other frigates are 32 to 36 guns. The Humphreys frigates are 44s. Uh, they are bigger, they're wider, they're longer, they're faster. They carry a bigger crew. Um, in the War of 1812, this is going to become a, a point of contention with the British. Um, but we tend to focus on those and think about those larger 32 plus gun vessels when we're when we're thinking about the early American experience. But in the Barbary War, as it was in the Quasi War, as it's going to be in the War of 1812, and it dramatically becomes this way in the 1820s as the American Navy tries to fight piracy in the Caribbean, it's actually the smaller vessels that play huge roles in how naval forces are used. Really, you know, the, the phrase I use in the article is that they're the utility infielders of how maritime force is applied in these conflicts. Because if you only have a handful of frigates, you don't want to be sending them off on convoy duty all the time, right? And a smaller ship can handle that kind of operation. The other thing that you discover is when you're working in shallow waters, archipelagic waters like you have in the Quasi-War, because that's mostly fought in the Caribbean, or on the, on the north coast of Africa, where you have shallows and you have reefs, having vessels of shallow draft is valuable to you, especially when you're blockading a place like Tripoli. And so what we find when we get deep into the operational history of the Barbary War is that for the most part, these frigates do not kind of sail alone and unafraid. They sail in pairs. They're, they're operating in tactical pairs. Often it's a frigate with one of these smaller vessels, whether one of the schooners or the brigs. So we're talking about ships like Enterprise, the first Enterprise. We're talking about Scourge or Nautilus. And there, there's a number of these smaller ships that fight in the Barbary War. And so the way these, you know, when these are operating properly, when they're working together well, I think a great example that I use in the, in the article is Constitution working with Enterprise. You know, Edward Preble is the Commodore of the squadron. He finds himself on blockade duty off of Tripoli aboard Constitution. And his pair, his, his co-worker there is Stephen Decatur in command of Enterprise. And so Enterprise can sweep into the shallows, check up on ships, enforce the blockade in a close manner, while Constitution stays offshore with its heavy guns ready to provide support as necessary, but also in a way as a mothership for Enterprise, right? They can stay on station longer, they carry more food, they carry more water, all that kind of stuff. And in what, that situation... Relative, yeah, what's the relative size of the two ships? They, is Enterprise... I think the easiest way to think about it is actually in crew complement, right? So okay. crew complement of something like Enterprise, you know, one of your schooners, one of your brigs, it's probably going to be somewhere between 75 and 100 sailors, where you're talking 350 to 400 sailors on one of the frigates. Wow. Um, and so in this example that I'm, that I'm using and that I use in the article, this is how Intrepid, the ship that becomes named Intrepid, that sails into Tripoli Harbor to burn Philadelphia successfully in that, in that irregular operation. Um, that's how they catch Intrepid. It's, Mystico is the name of the original vessel. And Enterprise sweeps into the shallows and scares this ship as it tries to run out of Tripoli, out of the blockade, to break the blockade. And it drives the quarry into the deep water and right into the waiting arms of Constitution. Right? And they capture the ship, and, and it goes on to become a famous American operation. And that's the, uh, the fifth uh, example command, commanded by Starrett. Is that that's uh... well? So so Starrett is in command of Enterprise later or earlier in the in the conflict. Uh, Starrett's the first skipper of Enterprise during the Barbary War. He actually wins the first uh, ship on ship engagement against the against the Tripolitan ship Tripoli. Um, at the very beginning of the conflict. And then he's going to turn command over to Decatur, who captures Mystico 
the 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 flip side of that coin of the tactical pairing is when it doesn't work and, and philadelphia itself is actually a great example of when it doesn't work the reason that that bainbridge and and yeah i i you know tongue-in-cheek call him bad luck bill bainbridge in the article because here's a man who lost three naval vessels to the enemy uh in his career the reason he runs Philadelphia aground is because he goes in shore close chasing a blockade runner. Why does he have to take the heavy frigate Philadelphia in shore close? Well, it's because he sent his consort, Vixen, he sent it away to go do something else. Hmm. And he didn't have it for that tactical pairing. And he runs aground because of it. And they lose Philadelphia because of it. And hundreds of American sailors become POWs. By the way, great book by Fred Liner that recently came out all about that POW experience. Um, in the Barbary War. And so what we see in the Barbary War is we see the convoy duty, we see carrying of supplies, we see carrying of messages, we see blockade enforcement, we see support to the land operation once it begins around Derna, all being provided by these smaller ships. They really are the linchpin of how the operations are conducted. That's great. Um, another thing that your article, another major theme in the article is that uh, it highlights the role of allies and partners in in the Barbary Wars. And so this was another one where not being an historian, you know, there's a lot of people in the Navy, I think, who had this cursory understanding that the young U.S. Navy sails to North Africa to bravely fight the pirates alone and unafraid. But you bring out some really salient points about cooperation with other navies, about military or naval diplomacy, uh, and about the role of of having to work with other navies and other, uh, you know, other nations in the region. So describe some of that for us. Yeah, I think your, your kind of identification of our, our understanding of the Barbary War is sort of being the alone and unafraid idea that somehow the yeah. Americans stood up to the North African powers in a way that the Europeans were unwilling to or unable to. And it gave, it gave that heritage gives us a sense of pride, right? And a sense of, right. of uh, a sense of the specialness that we ascribe to our Navy. The, the trouble is when you actually start diving into the operational records and the details and the correspondence, the, the primary sources, if you will, what you find is, is a, it's the Mediterranean Sea. It's an incredibly busy place, right? It is today. If you've ever steamed through the Straits of Gibraltar, you know how busy this part of the world is in a maritime sense, it was just as busy back then. And so the idea that the Americans kind of went into this sea and were all by themselves, when you start to think about it logically, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And then you get into the sources and you realize, no, the Americans had to have support in order to conduct these operations because there were no American bases in the Mediterranean. So at the very start, you had to have somewhere to resupply from. You had to somewhere, have somewhere to, to base your materiel out of. You had to get food. You had to get water. I mean, you didn't have to get fuel because you had sails, but you still needed to be resupplied. You needed to refit your ships when they would potentially get damaged. All the kinds of logistical support elements that we think of today still exist in the age of sail. And so that's kind of the starting point is at first, the question is, where are you going to base out of? And if you're going to base out of somewhere there, that means you need a partner, you need a friend. And the Americans at first, kind of interestingly, rely on the British. Uh, and that might surprise us in, in the early American era when we're between wars against the British, the revolution, and then the War of 1812. But at first, the Americans base themselves out of, out of Gibraltar and, and to a certain extent out of Malta. But what they discover, though, is that the Look, the British, the Royal Navy is so big and requires so much logistical support itself that if you're an American ship that has, happens to be in one of these ports, when a bunch of British ships come in, well, the British ships get all the supplies and you have to sit and wait until more stuff shows up. And this doesn't really work for the Americans. And so Edward Preble realizes he's got to move his base somewhere else. And so he begins entering negotiations with what we think of today is, is Naples and Sicily, right? Then it was the kingdom of Naples. It's going to become the kingdom of the two Sicilies a little bit later on. But he begins negotiating with these local Italians and bases the American force at Syracuse on the, on the island of Sicily because the Italians agree to lend warehouse space, lend armory to keep weapons in and to keep ammunition in. They agree to allow the Americans to use their prize courts. 
And so that's the starting point of these kinds of relationships. The other thing that the Americans discover is they're not the only ones fighting Tripoli. So they arrive in the Mediterranean to discover that the Swedes are already at war with Tripoli. The Kingdom of Naples is already at war with Tripoli. Denmark is already at war with Tripoli. And all of these forces have naval vessels and squadrons in the Mediterranean waters. And so it's a natural to start partnering with these folks. One of the interesting developments that we see when we look at the correspondence back to Washington, D.C., though, is that the Americans back home don't really think this alliance idea or partnership idea is necessary. They don't realize the practical necessity of it in the Mediterranean. And so when Sweden actually offers a formal alliance with the United States, the, the government in Washington turns them down. Now, mm. the naval officers in the Mediterranean say, but Let's we're going to do this. Right. Yeah. And so, right. you know, we think about those terms we use today and we use them kind of loosely, but allies versus partners versus friends versus collaborators, whatever label we want to apply, they actually mean things, right? And so in the Barbary War, we have a partnership with Sweden, but we don't have an alliance with them. And that lasts for a little while until the Swedes make a peace treaty with, with Tripoli, and then, of course, they withdraw their forces. But so we see this across the entirety of the American conflict of the Commodores who are in command looking at who else is around and who else can we work with. They do end up getting significant logistical support out of Malta during Preble's attacks on Tripoli Harbor one summer. Um, and the Italians even end up, in essence, leasing gunboats with crews to the Americans to fight in those battles also. So you have, you have an Italian gunboat with an Italian crew with an American officer corps on board commanding it in the battles in Tripoli Harbor. And so the idea that this is the Americans alone and unafraid is, is really kind of demonstrably false. Yeah. And we haven't even talked about William Eaton and Presley O'Bannon and the Marines and the attack on Derna, which was really made up of Bedouin warriors, uh, Greek mercenaries, and anybody else the Americans could pay to fight on their side. A pickup team. Yeah. Are there any examples? I, so you just mentioned, you know, the, the least uh, Italian warship with a, a predominantly pr Italian crew with an you know, American commander, if you will, on board. Are there any examples in the war of actual uh, foreign, you know, other Navy ships and U.S. Navy ships tactically operating together in, in one battle or, or in more than one battle? Or did they always sort of fight separately but cooperate sort of logistically or in, in other ways? When it came to like pure combat operations, that the the example of those those attacks on Tripoli Harbor with the Italian gunboats are kind of the 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 only real example Got it. Um, of of naval combat where you've got multinational forces working together. But in the blockade of Tripoli, especially early on in the first year, eighteen months of the conflict, the Swedes and the Americans work directly together in those kind of maritime security operations, as we would call them today, right? Like there is direct collaboration. Hey, you know, we're going to send our ships at this time. You're going to send your ships at that time. Let's make sure that there's not a gap in coverage. You're going to cover this portion of the coast. We'll cover that portion. I mean, it's direct collaboration um, in order to maintain the blockade. Um, with Denmark, it's a little bit different. It's, with Denmark, it's mostly information sharing and intelligence support. Uh, with the British, it's mostly logistical support. So it depends on which partner we're talking about and what the Americans are able to get them to bring to the operation. And and most of that, the the, the detail, working out the details of what kind of cooperation is going to happen, that's happening out front. That's happening with the Commodores, right? That's right. That that is that is naval diplomacy, as we would call it, right? Because the Commodores are driving it themselves. Now, in some cases, they have assistance. They, they have help from the State Department's consuls who are in the region. Uh, William Eaton's one of those examples. William Eaton was actually the consul to Tunis uh, prior to uh, cooking up this idea of finding the day's brother and trying to do some regime change in Tripoli and, and getting this mercenary army together. Um, but he was actually a State Department representative at the start of the conflict. And the consuls work with the Commodores. 
as well as there's some naval agents that are kind of floating around the Mediterranean. And their job is to help the Navy find the supplies it needs, uh, funnel the money to the right suppliers. In some cases, they lease ships to work as supply ships to resupply the vessels that are off Tripoli in the blockade. Um, so there are civilians around that the Commodores are working with. But the idea, the strategic guidance is coming at that operational level from the Commodores during the conflict. Hey, I, so I, I, a question that just popped into my mind as you're describing all of this is uh, how often, and, and I know you've done the primary source research, so how often did the Commodores out in the Mediterranean squadron, how, how often did, did they hear from, you know, Washington. Did they get letters on a weekly basis? Did it go months? Uh, that's a really, yeah. that's a really yeah. good question. I, I've never really even thought about it. And so it's not, I haven't really mapped it out. So I'm just going off of my, my sense of the, the sources having yeah. worked in them. I think it's like an every couple months sort of thing, they might get some kind of directive. And as you could imagine, most of it's out of date. Right. Right. So, you know, I talk with my midshipmen about this a lot, especially in plebe naval history. Right. We talk about how communication changes over time and the speed of communication and the impact it has on naval operations. And in the age of sail, what we have to remember is what we're talking about is a letter. And how does that letter get from the secretary of the Navy or the president in Washington, D.C. to someone on foreign station? Well, it's got a sail there. So. We're talking in the age of sail, just for a rough estimate, it's probably going to take you about four weeks to get across the Atlantic. Well, now you're at the Straits of Gibraltar. Do you know where the Commodore is? No, you don't. So now you got to go sail around the Mediterranean until you find them wow. and then hand that letter off. So really, we're probably talking at best five, maybe six weeks to get a message, which means 10 to 12 weeks to get a correspondence, right? A message and an answer. Right. Which means, right, 12 weeks later, the entire conflict has changed. Yeah. And so this, when we think about command and control, in the 19th century, we're talking about command. We're not talking about control. Because you can't control. Because you don't have the speed of knowledge or communication necessary to exact control on a maritime force. And that's why most of these orders and most of these letters that you read when you actually get into the correspondence and you see the orders that are being given, they almost always end with some version of a paragraph that says, but we trust your judgment because we know things might have changed by the time you see this. And so you should do what you think is best for the country and the Navy. Amazing. Right. And, and so when we talk about in the, in the modern day, when we talk about things like mission command, we talk about things like, you know, command and control. And I remember when, 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 uh, General Dempsey was chairman of the Joint Chiefs and Mission Command was really a high, like everyone was talking about it in the Joint Force. And I remember talking to an Army friend of mine who said, hey, do you Navy guys do Mission Command? I said, we don't call it Mission Command. We call it Naval Leadership. <laughs> and we've done it for centuries. Here's a biography of Nelson. Go read it. Right. And like th right. this is how because of the communication challenges, this is how it had to work. And so these Commodores had enormous amounts of latitude. To, to govern, run, and make the strategy and operational planning for the conflict that they were involved in. Yeah, now as we think about, so I, I want to get to some uh, lessons for, you know, modern day gray zone operations, but I also immediately that conversation there about command and control or lack of control makes me think about a lot of things that are being written for proceedings about high-end conflict, about an adversary that can take out your ability to see to your force or can threaten your uh, communication satellites, your space-based assets, or if you do communicate, can can uh, intercept those communications and then counter-target you, right? So, uh, you know, it, in the literature today, people are talking about mission command again. They're talking about one-way communications from higher out to the fleet without the fleet maybe uh, being able to roger up that communications. Um, but, you know, very different than the way the U.S. Navy has operated the last 25 years, where you're in constant communications, often in VTCs or in hundreds of emails back and forth a day. Uh, this, this could be, you know, 
we're talking here bar rewards back to the future in terms of having to rethink how do we how do we think about command and and control or lack of control it's fascinating stuff yeah um, it really is and and the reality is you know this is one of the great values of studying our naval history right is that we can find these moments in time when we can we can try and find some insights that help us think about wrestle with and and maybe ask better questions of our present day you know, I think about this conversation you and I have been having right now, and it, and it reminds me of, of William Sims's essay in Proceedings uh, uh, entitled Military Character, in which he talks all about trust. And he talks all about trust up the chain of command, down the chain of command. Really, the, the whole article, the whole essay is about mission command and how you execute it. He even references Aufreichstaktik, which is right the German kind of roots of what we in the American joint force think of as mission command. You know, and so this is this is 1915 um, when he when he gives this speech that he turns into this proceedings article, and it and it's all about trust. Trust is the center point of that kind of naval leadership. And in the 21st century, I think one of the questions, one of the insights that this raises for us, and a question that we should ask is, how much has trust been eroded out of our C2 system? Not because anyone distrusts each other, but simply because it's not required. Yeah. Someone can tell you what to do and you can respond with, yes, I just did that. Because, because the communication is there, the trust is not required in the same way. And therefore, potentially the trust is eroded without us realizing it. But building that back becomes a challenge if you've lost it. That's a great point. I, I, Sometimes midshipmen will ask me about on this topic, right? And I remember um, being the, the naval attache in Russia at, at a better time. This is about 20 years ago. And we had U.S. Navy ships going to Vladivostok and St. Petersburg and Petropavlovsk. But we had, you know, this is an example that I use about, about that trust or about the, the, the perils of instantaneous communication. So a destroyer, uh, a, a one of the last uh, Spurs class destroyers pulled into Petropavlovsk. This is 2005, and uh, a sailor on board got injured. It was just he he tripped and fell on the ship, broke his leg, um, and there were the the skipper of the ship pulled me aside, <laughs> and he um, he showed me how many emails he had just on that one sailor. You know, having a, a, you know, first there was worry from higher headquarters, you know, did it happen ashore and was there any, you know, Russians involved and was it a, a drinking incident or all those kinds of things. He, he probably had like 40 emails that first morning just on the, the basis of one sailor breaking his leg. And, you know, to me, that's an example, like maybe you don't need to trust people with that instantaneous communication. But boy, if uh, if we're in a hot war. Uh, where the adversary is taking away that ability or you have to shut down that ability to communicate. We're talking about a whole different communication paradigm than I think today's leaders are, are used to. And so hearkening back to the Barbary Wars, hearkening back to the thought process of, I may not know what my boss wants me to do for five weeks or six weeks or longer. That's, that's something to think about. It's, I think there's some really great applied history lessons here that you bring out in this article. I uh, love it for those reasons. Um, let's get to um, a bit of the applied lessons for what's happening in the South China Sea. You call it, I think, the uh, uh, the, the Asian Lake or the Asian Mediterranean, right? Yeah. Um, but you know, this the readers who are familiar with this maritime counterinsurgency project have read the pieces by Hunter Styers and by um, you know Josh Taylor and. Uh, you know, lots of authors here, Peter Schwartz last fall, et cetera. Um, and there's a lot of lessons that you apply from your piece to uh, from from the Barbary Wars, from the Decatur and Preble and uh, from this uh, uh, force structure that we we talked about. So let's let's apply some of those. Talk about um, what lessons you think are really prescient from uh, this article for how we think about pushing back against China's gray zone operations today. Yeah. So, so the first thing I want to say is, is I am hesitant with the word lessons 
Because okay. lessons tends to imply that, hey, there's this checklist of things that we can learn, and if we do them, we will succeed. And that's, I don't think that's how history works, right? I think, I think what we get from studying our history is potentially some insights, some wisdom, and at best, what it does is it offers us the chance to ask better questions about the contemporary moment, right? Okay, I think that's a great so, point. Yep. Yeah, so, so what are some of the insights that, that this history gives us? What are some of the questions it should cause us to ask? Well, we can go back to the partnership issue and, and we can ask the question. And I think the Navy has been pretty good about asking questions in this vein in recent years. But we need to ask the question of do we have the right structure of partnerships and alliances in whatever theater we're talking about? Right. So we talk about this maritime counterinsurgency idea and we tend to apply it to the South China Sea. But much of it applies to the Baltic also. We're seeing some of it play out in the Black Sea in this very moment. Sure. Um, and so, I, I mean, frankly, we're seeing some of it in the Eastern Mediterranean starting to ramp up in the last 10 days or so. And so it's not just a lesson for, quote unquote, the China challenge, right? Uh, this is this. These are insights that we can apply to multiple geographies, multiple potential adversaries. Do we have that right balance between knowing who what our alliance partners are going to do, what they're interested in? but also who we can partner with. And how do we take advantage of those partnerships? You know, I think of in the, in the South China Sea as our example, I think of potential partners and friends like India and like Vietnam, where, you know, the odds of a, a very strict alliance in a treaty sense is probably pretty slim, but man, do we have interests that align a lot of the time in that part of the world. And we should be working together much in the same way that the Americans worked with the Swedes and, and worked with the Navy from Denmark in the Barbary War. You know, we don't have to have an alliance in order for us to start working together. But that does require the Navy to be comfortable with that. Let's be honest, we are, we're pretty comfortable working with our allies, right? Like sure. working with the Australians, working with the Japanese, working with the South Koreans. Um, we've, we're pretty good at that. And we've gotten pretty good at that over the last several decades. But this idea of how do you work with the partners, how do you do something beyond just, you know, a, a pass X? How do you do something beyond just steaming around together and talking about maybe boarding an illegal fishing boat? How do you work together more than that? How do you build on that and do something more than that is, is the kinds of questions that I think this history should cause us to ask. I think when it comes to the force structure thing, I think there are very hard questions we need to ask about our fleet architecture today. Um, I know that the Constellation class frigate is on its way, but it's still not here yet. Yep. Uh, and this idea that small combatants were the linchpin of the force in the early American Navy, and we can see all the different things that they did. We don't really have the forces that do those things. Um, the other reality is more ships means more water covered, even if they're smaller. I think an example here that, that runs in parallel, because it's the same leadership, it's the same officers, uh, it's really the same Navy, is in the 1820s when the U.S. Navy goes to fight piracy in the Caribbean as the Spanish Empire crumbles. They do, a, the Board of Naval Commissioners do an assessment, and they kind of do a, a, a think tanky study in, in, that, in, the, in the 1820 sense of, of that phrase. And they determine that for the same price as what they would spend building and supplying a frigate, they could get 10 to 12 schooners that they could purchase, arm, and supply. And if you're going to fight pirates, the schooners are way better at it than the frigates are. And for the same price, you're building an entirely different force structure, but it's more effective for the mission because they can cover more water, because you've got more of them. Well, yeah. in, a, in a maritime counterinsurgency situation, in a maritime security situation, in operations short of declared conflict, that ability to cover sea space actually matters. You know, we think about what the Philippines are going through with the Chinese right now, and the interaction between the Philippine resupply vessels, the Philippine Navy and Coast Guard, and Philippine fishermen, interacting with the Chinese Coast Guard and the Chinese Navy, more ships is better in a situation like that. It's not always the biggest ship that matters. Sometimes it's the numbers that matter. And a lot of small ships can go a long way. 
And yeah. our Navy hasn't been built that way for a very long time. Right. We have very much focused on the large surface combatants. You know, I, I once I once heard a Navy captain tell me that the smallest ship he wanted to use to fight a pirate in the Gulf of Aden was an Arleigh Burke class DDG. And my head kind of exploded because it was like, yeah. are you kidding me? But in, in our kind of post cold war Navy, the Arleigh Burke class DDG is the answer to everything. And right. I think, I think the lessons of the past, the insights that we get from the past should suggest to us that we need to ask hard questions about that today. Yeah. It's a, that's a billion dollar answer to every problem, right? Um, I was thinking as you were saying that, that uh, I think it was in the September issue, we had an article by our former Coast Guard federal executive fellow. So for the last couple of years, we've had a Coast Guard officer uh, on permanent duty here for a year, for an academic year. And Steve Hulse was the lieutenant commander who just left us. And in the September issue, he wrote a great piece because his previous job, he was CEO of one of the Sentinel class of uh, fast response cutters, right? Over in the, in the, the, well, he took it. He took that boat, that ship uh, across the Atlantic, across the Mediterranean and to the, uh, to Bahrain, to fifth fleet. And fifth fleet has been uh, sort of in awe of the, the, I think it's five Sentinel class cutters that they've got out there. And Steve was offering, Hey, this is something that one, there's a, a hot production line Two, they're very capable ships. Three, um, they're not that expensive, right? Yeah, These there's are, a number of them. I mean, the, the cost of a Sentinel really isn't that much more than a 60 Romeo. Right. And, and like, I mean, it wouldn't cost much to build a squadron of those and strap some missiles to the back of them and paint them gray. Yeah, and that's what uh, Commander Hulse's point was. In his, and, you know, uh, this, his this kind of idea, this isn't, this isn't necessarily, you know, in our contemporary sense, this isn't necessarily new either. I mean, Jerry Hendricks was writing about this back in, what, 2009, 2010, when he was writing the Ford's Not, Fer or the Ford's Not Ferraris article series. Right. Um, and so, you know, there have been discussions of these kind of alternative force structures. You know, I, I remember one of the things that Captain Hendricks wrote about in that article was saying, like, he wasn't suggesting changing the entire force structure of the Navy. He was suggesting take like five or 10% and that's it. Yeah. That, that alone would make an enormous change. You know, we have a, we have a faculty member here on the Naval Academy staff. We spent some time in the Pegasus class back in the, the late seventies, early eighties, right? You talk with any of the sailors that served on those hydrofoils, those harpoon armed hydrofoils, um, and there's still a couple of there's a couple flags banging around. I think that that still had experience with that. And well, our, our our current boss, Admiral Daly, right? He, yeah, he and was, you talk to them about tour. that experience, and it's really yeah. kind of fascinating. But I think the lesson or the insight from Pegasus is how quickly a good idea like that can get squashed by the the uh, shipbuilding, by the technical aspects of keeping niche programs like that going uh, and, and how kind of quote unquote big Navy doesn't always support that kind of thing. Yeah, it's a great point. All right. Well, uh, BJ, we're about out of time uh, before we go any saved rounds uh, or I wanted to ask you uh, how today's midshipmen are doing in your history classes. They're doing great. Like uh, one of the great joys of my job is teaching American naval history to plebes uh, because it, it allows me to do a couple things. It allows me to help me uh, explain to them the value of studying our past and understanding it uh, in order to make good professional decisions. Look, I know that we're a technological service. I know that we work with a lot of high tech systems and weapons and platforms, but at its heart, our job is a human job. We're leaders. And it's all about the interaction of human societies and the interaction between human individuals. And that's what the study of history is the study of, is, is study of the human condition. Um, so I get to share that with them. While at the same time, I get to start building up their understanding of their profession. And this thing that they've raised their right hand for the first time just a couple months ago, and this thing they've joined. Uh, and many of them don't really get it. I didn't get it when I was that age. It, it took quite a while before I truly understood what I was getting myself into. But to help them walk down that path is, is really a delightful thing. That's awesome. 
Uh, well, we're out of time. It's been great talking to you. Uh, my guest today is Captain B.J. Armstrong, U.S. Navy. His article in the October issue of Proceedings is titled Counterinsurgency to the Shores of Tripoli. And you can find B.J. Uh, on Twitter at WWATMD, which stands for What Would Alfred Thayer Mahan Do? So at WWATMD. If you're uh, if you're a history fan and want to follow and get good tidbits on a regular basis of you know important dates and things in Navy history and other insights into into what's happening with the U.S. Navy today, I, I recommend it. It's a great follow. So, uh, BJ, thanks, thanks again, and thanks to the Naval Institute Press for publishing the second edition of my 21st Century Mahan book, which, if anyone's interested, is almost 50 percent larger than the original three new chapters new introduction new conclusion it's a different book and i'm pretty proud of it a 21st century mahan second edition all right well bj great great to have you on the show and thanks again for writing for proceedings and good luck with your plebes great thank you bill all right uh, reminder this episode is brought to you by blue cross blue shield what makes good vision coverage i knew it when i saw it Things like fully covered vision care exams for all members. Access to over 125,000 independent eye care providers and national retailers. Plus benefits you can use at many online retailers. That's why I chose Blue Cross Blue Shield FVP Vision. See what we can do for you at bcbsfvpvision.com. And until next week, remember... Victory begins at the Naval Institute.